Let's leave. You got me. Well, you can look at it when you get in. <laughs> yes, sir. I got it under control. Have you ever watched a movie from 15, 20 years ago and thought, man, movies used to look so good. Is it just me getting old or did films really have something special about them? At the beginning, I thought it was just a personal perception phenomenon, maybe related to a feeling of nostalgia when looking back at the movies of my childhood. And then, of course, the film versus digital debate. Uh, digital production and, uh, and uh, DCPs is the death of cinema as I know it. But the more I thought about it and the more I watched, I realized there was a hidden aspect of images that is often overlooked. And that is texture. But what exactly is texture? Texture is what tells our senses that something is real because in the real world, nothing is perfectly uniform. It's those little imperfections and variations that make things feel tangible and authentic. Ever since humans started making images, long before movies were even a thing, we were always tied to the materials we had. The surfaces we drew on and the pigments or dyes we used didn't just serve a functional purpose, it was their interaction that gave the image its very essence, its texture. Fast forward to the end of the 19th century, photography was invented, and even though the image was not painted on a surface anymore, but instead captured first on plates and then on film, the textural properties of those mediums were all there for us to see. Those early film stocks were grainy. Maybe a little bit too grainy. But just like we started painting on rough cave walls and switched to smoother canvases later on, it was just a matter of time. In fact, film stocks got cleaner and cleaner, eventually reaching a sweet spot. Clear enough for detail, yet textured enough to feel real. That texture dominated both the photography and the filmmaking world, and then, after a few decades of glory, everything slowly transitioned to digital. And at that point, what we used to call grain changed its name into noise. Noise then, perceived as one of the biggest enemies of digital filmmaking, has seen camera manufacturers rack their brains to eliminate it as much as possible. The results? Images got so clean that if you were to place a camera on a tripod and shoot a non-moving subject, you'd hardly be able to tell whether it's a video or a still photo. It's actually a video. What can we say? Mission accomplished, right? Everyone was so happy. Well, not exactly. Camera companies seem to be on this eternal quest for cleanliness. <laughs> I don't know who who directed that. Who was the kind of higher up per guard of digital cameras that said we need to make the cleanest image possible. We need to. Like, I don't know who did that. I think we're compromising emotion and feel for digital cleanliness. I think it's a mistake. I think it's a mistake. Greg Fraser shot Doom Part Two on an IMAX digital camera. Very large sensor, very clean image. But then, in order to give the image that grit and feel of realness, they did what's called a film out. They took that digitally shot material, they recorded onto film, and then scanned it back with the added textural properties of the analog medium. And Greg Fraser is definitely not the only one. There are many directors and cinematographers that stick with film for its textural properties, or at least try to replicate them digitally. But why do filmmakers go out of their way to add grain to their images? Is it just nostalgia and gut feeling, or is there more to it? Well, it seems like there is. It turns out that noise and grain affect how we perceive images in a surprising way. Don't want to get too nerdy, but let me explain. Images have frequencies. We have low frequencies, broad, smooth details, medium frequencies, the general details, and high frequencies, the tiniest details like skin pores and hairs. When noise or grain is present or added, it perceptually softens the high frequency details like skin pores so they become less noticeable. But here's the cool part. It simultaneously makes low and medium frequency areas, the part that we mostly focus on, appear sharper and more resolute 
even if they're not. It's just a perception thing. If you want to nerd a bit and read the full paper, there's a link in the description. But who's really listening? Well, while the majority of the manufacturers are trying to minimize and sometimes hide the noise of their sensors, Ari, the Rolls Royce of cinema cameras, did exactly the opposite. They released a feature called textures in their latest Alexa camera. And reading the white paper about their textures, one thing struck me the most, and it's this bit here. There's always one RE texture active in camera. And if you choose the K445 default texture, the camera will capture a cinematic image no matter what the situation in the same way as every other RE digital camera you've worked with before. Which means that they now gave you control over the type and amount of texture you want, but even before offering this feature, a base level of texture has always been present within RE's images, because RE always understood that texture is fundamental to make an image feel real. Look, at the end of the day, it's also about personal taste. If you like crispy, clean images, awesome. Roger Deakins, probably one of the greatest cinematographers alive, never added any type of grain to his images, and he clearly stated that in a post on his website. But again, he uses an Ari Alexa when he shoots digitally, so he is in fact working with an already textured image. But if you're on team grain, like me, you probably slapped a layer of grain, used some DaVinci Resolve grain on your images, and you might have liked it, you might have not liked it, but one thing is just slapping some grain. Another thing is to make the grain feel like it's part of the image. Because on film, the grain is the image. The grain forms the image. They're not two separate things. Well, luckily for us, there is an amazing paper on physically accurate grain rendering. I mean, it's really, really good. They actually modeled the silver halide process, so how the grains form, clump, and vary depending on exposure. So for example, the grain in the shadows doesn't have the same appearance as the grain in the midtones, which is not the same as the grain in the highlights. There's one problem. The algorithm is slow. I mean, painfully slow. It takes around 10 to 20 seconds to render a single 4K frame on GPUs, so it's clearly not suitable for real time. But what if we could take that algorithm, generate some grain layers based on the luminance range? And sure, it would take a long time. But once it's done, we could take those grain layers, composite them back onto the image in their respective luminance range, and get real-time, physically accurate grain that feels like it's part of the image and not just an overlay on top. If you're interested in the process and want to learn more and even download some of the grain layers that I generated completely for free, you can head over to film-match.com or click on the link in the description. I have a full blog post over there with all this nerdy stuff, so I hope to see you there. In the meantime, please like, share and subscribe and until next time, 